One o'clock, Mistress Nutter and Mother Chatos were still at the hut, impatiently awaiting the return of Fancy, but nearly an hour elapsed before he appeared. What has detained thee so long? demanded the hag sharply, as he stood before them. You shall hear, Mistress, replied Fancy. I have had a busy time of it, I assure you, and though I should never accomplish my errand, on arriving at Rubble, I found the place invested by Sir Thomas Metcalf and a host of armed men who had been sent thither by Parson Hall for the purpose of arresting you, madam, addressing Mistress Nutter, and liberating the Norwell and Potts. The night was in a great fume, for in spite of the force brought against it, the house had been stoutly defended by Nicholas Ashton, who had worsted the besieging party and captured two Alsatian captains, hangers on of Sir Thomas. Appearing in the character of an enemy, I was immediately surrounded by Metcalf and his men, who swore they would cut my throat unless I undertook to procure the liberation of the two bravos in question as well as that of Norwell and Potts. I told them I was come for the express purpose of setting free the two last named gentlemen, but with respect to former, I had no instruction, and they must arrange the matter with Master Nicholas himself. Upon this, Sir Thomas became exceedingly rough and insolent, and proceeded to such lengths that I resolved to chastise him, and in so doing formed a feat which will tend greatly to exalt Richard's character, courage, and strength. Let us hear it, my daughter champion, cried Mother Chatter. While Metcalf was pouring for his rage and menacing me with uplifted hand, to show the familiar, I seized him by the throat, dragged him from his horse, and in spite of the efforts of his men, whose blows fell upon me fit as hail, and quite as harmlessly, I bore him through the garden to the back of the house, where my shouts soon brought Nicholas and others to my assistance, and after delivering my catty to them, I dismounted. The squire, you will imagine, was astonished to see me, and greatly applauded my prowess. I replied with a modesty, becoming my assumed character, that I had done nothing, and in reality the feat was nothing to me. But I told him I had something of the utmost importance to communicate, and which could not be delayed a moment, whereupon he led me to a small room adjoining the hall. While the crestfallen knight was left to vent his rage and mortification on the groom's to whose custody he was committed. You acted your part to perfection, said Mr. Nutter. I trust my sweet fancy for that, said the hag. There is no familiar like him, none whatever. Your praises make me blush, rejoined the fancy. But to proceed, I fulfilled your instructions to the letter, and excited Nicholas's horror and indignation by the tale I told him. I laughed in my sleeve all the while, but I maintained a very different countenance with him. He fought me full of anguish and despair. He questioned Question me as to my proceedings at Malkin Tower, and I amazed him with a description of a fearful storm I had encountered, of my interview with old Demdi, and her atrocious treatment of Alison, to all of which he listened with profound interest. Richard himself could not have moved him more, perhaps not so much. As soon as I had finished, he vowed he would rescue Alison from the murderous hag and prevent the latter from committing further mischief, and bidding me come with him, he repaired to the room in which Norwell and Potts were confined. We found them both fast asleep in their chairs, but Nicholas quickly awakened them, and some explanations ensured, which did not at first appear very clear and satisfactory to either magistrate or attorney, but in the end they agreed to accompany us on the expedition, Master Potts declaring it would compensate him for his mischances if he could arrest Mother Demdi. I hope he may have his wish, said Mother Chatos. Aye, but he declares that his next step should be to arrest you, mistress, observed Fancy, with a laugh. Arrest me, cried the hag. Marry, let him touch me if he dares. My term is not out yet, and with thee to defend me, my brave Fancy, I have no fear. Right, replied the familiar. But to go on with my story, Sir Thomas Metcalf was next brought forward, and after some warm altercation, peace was at length established between him and the squire, and hands were shaken all round. Wine was then called for by Nicholas, who at the same time directed that the two Alsatian captains should be brought from the cellar where they had been placed for safety. The first part of the order was obeyed, but the second was found impractical, inasmuch as the two heroes found their way to the inner cellar and had emptied so many glasses that they were utterly incapable of moving while the wine was being discussed and unexpected arrival to place. An arrival of whom? inquired Mistress Hunter. Sir Ralph Ashton and a large party, replied Fancy. Parson Holden, it seems. 
not content with sending Sir Thomas and his route to the aid of his friends, I proceeded with the same purpose to Warley, and the result was the appearance of a new party. A brief explanation from Nicholas and myself served to put Sir Ralph in possession of all that had occurred, and he declared his readiness to accompany the expedition to Pendle Hill and to take all his followers with him. Sir Thomas Metcalfe expressed an equally strong desire to go with him, and of course it was a seed of I am bound to tell you, madam, added fancy to Mistress Nutter, that your conduct is viewed in the most suspicious light by every one of these persons, except Nicholas, who made an effort to defend you. I care not what happens to me if I succeed in rescuing my child, said a lady, but have they set out on the expedition? By this time, no doubt they have, replied fancy. I got off by saying I would ride on to Pendle Hill and stationing myself on its summit, give them a signal when they should advance upon their prey. And now, good mistress, I pray you dismiss me. I want to cast off this shape which I find an encumbrance and resume mine own. I will return when it is time for you to set out. The hag waved her hand and the familiar was on. Half an hour relaxed and he turned not. Mistress Nutter became fearfully impatient. Three quarters and even the old hag was uneasy. An hour and he stood before me. Dwarfish, findish. Monstrous. It is time, he said in a harsh voice, for the horns were moving in the rest of mother's ears. Come then, she cried, rushing wildly for I, I, I come, replied the high following her. Not so fast, you cannot go without me, added Fancy. Here, good mistress, is your broomstick. Away for Pendle Hill, screamed the hag. I, for Pendle Hill, echoed Fancy. And there was a whirling of dark figures through the air as before. Presently, they alighted on the summit of Hendel Hill, which seemed to be wrapped in a dense cloud, for Mistress Nutter could scarcely see a yard before her. Fancy's eyes were powerful enough to penetrate the room, but stepping back a few yards, he said, The expedition is at the foot of the hill, where they have made a halt. We must wait a few moments, till I can ascertain what they mean. To do. Ah, I see. They are dividing into three parties. One detachment, headed by Nicholas Ashton, with whom are Potts and Norwell, is about to make their ascent from the spot where they now stand. Another, commanded by Sir Ralph Ashton, is moving towards the butt end of the hill, and the third, headed by Sir Thomas Metcalfe, is proceeding to the right. These are goodly preparations. Ha ha. But what do I behold? The first detachment have a prisoner with them. It is Jem Device, whom they have captured on the way, I suppose. I can tell from the rascal's lust he is planning an escape. Patience, madam, I must see how he executes his design. There is no hurry. They are all scrambling up the hillsides. Someone slips and rolls down and bruises himself severely against the loose stone. Oh, oh, it is Master Hot. He is hit up by James Device, who takes him on his shoulders. What means they can near by such attention? We shall see anon. They continue to fight their way upward. They have now reached the narrow path among the rocks. Take heed or your necks will be broken. Oh ho, oh, well done Jim. Bravo lad, thy scheme is out now. Oh ho, oh, what has he done? Asked Mother Chatter. Run off with the attorney, with Master Potts, replied Fancy. Disappeared in the gloom, so that it is impossible Nicholas can follow him. Oh ho, oh. but my child, where is my child? Cried Mistress Nutter in agitated impatience. Come with me and I will lead you to her, replied Fancy, taking her hand. And do you keep close to us, Mistress, he added to Mother Chatter. Moving quickly along the heathy plain, they soon reached a small dry hollow about a hundred paces from the beacon, in the midst of which, as in a grave, was deposited the inanimate form of Alison. When the spot was indicated to her by fancy, the miserable mother flew to it, and with indescribable delight clasped her child to her breast. But the next moment a new fear seized her, for the limbs were stiff and cold, and the heart had apparently ceased to beat. She is dead, exclaimed Mistress Nutter frantically. No. She is only in a magical trance, said Fancy. My mistress can instantly revive her. Cry thee to do so, then good Chattox implored the lady. Better defer it till we have taken her. Hence, rejoined the hag. Oh no, now, now, let me be assured she lives, cried Mistress Nutter. Mother Chattox reluctantly assented, and touching Alison with her skinny finger, first upon the heart and then upon the brow, the poor girl began to show symptoms of life. My child, my child, cried Mistress Nutter, straining her to her breast. I am come to save thee. You will scarce succeed if you tarry here longer, said Fancy. Away. I come away, shrieked the hag, seizing Alison's arm. Where are you about to take her? asked Mistress Nutter. To 
mat but supplies mother her chat off. No, no, she shall not go there, returned the lady. And wherefore not, screamed the hag, she is mine now, and I say she shall go. Right, mistress, said Fancy, and lead the lady here if she objects to accompany her. But be quick, you shall not take her from me, shrieked mistress Nutter, holding her daughter fast. I see through your diabolical purpose. You have the same dark design as Mother Dendy, and would sacrifice her, but she shall not go with you, neither will I. Tut, exclaimed the hag, you have lost your senses on a sudden. I do not want your daughter, but come away or Mother Dendy will surprise us. Do not trifle with her longer, whispered Fancy to the hag. Drag the girl away or you will lose her. A few moments and it will be too late. Mother Chatox made an attempt to obey him, but Mistress Nutter resisted her. Curses on her. Her, she muttered, she is too strong for me. Do thou help me, she added, appealing to Fancy. I cannot, he replied. I have done all I dare to help you. You must accomplish the rest yourself. But my sweet imp, recollect, I recollect I have a master, interrupted the familiar, and a mistress too, cried the hag, and she will chastise thee if thou art disobedient. I command thee to carry off this girl. I have already told you I dare not, and I now say I will not, reply Fancy. Will not, shriek the hag, thou shalt smart for this. I will bury thee in the heart of this mountain, and make thee labour within it like a gnome. I will set thee to count the sand on the river bed, and the leaves on forest trees. Thou shalt know neither rest nor rest for I. Ho, 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 laugh Fancy. Dusty ride me, cried the hag. I will do it, thou so say, Jack and Nave. For the last time, you'll obey me. No, replied Fancy. And for this reason, your term is out. It expired at midnight. It is false, shrieked the hag, in accents of this terror and rage. I have months to run and will renew it. Before midnight, you might have done so, but it is now too late. Your reign is over, rejoined Fancy. Farewell, sweet mistress. We shall meet once again. Though scarcely under such pleasant circumstances. Dances as ever to four. It cannot be, my darling fancy. Thou art jesting with me, whimpered the hag. Thou wouldst not elude thy doting mistress us. I have done with thee, foul hag, rejoined the familiar, and am right glad my service is ended. I could have saved thee, but would not, and delayed my return for that very purpose. Thy soul was forfeited when I came back to thy hut. Then curses on thee for thy treachery, cried the hag, and on thy master who deceived me in bond he placed before me. The familiar laugh or slay. But what of Mother Dendy, pursued the hag? Hast thou no comfort for me? Tell me, the hour is likewise come, and I will be thee. But do not let her triumph over me. The familiar made no answer, but laughing derisively, stamped upon the ground, and it opened to receive him. Alison, cried Mistress Nutter, who in the meantime had vainly endeavoured to rouse her daughter to full consciousness. Fly with me, my child, the enemy is at hand. What enemy? asked Alison faintly. I have so many that I know not who you mean. But this is the worst of all. This is Mother Dendy, cried Mistress Nutter. She would hate your life. If we can but conceal ourselves for a short while, we are safe. I am too weak to move, said Alison. Besides, I dare not trust you. I have been deceived already. You may be an evil spirit in the likeness of my mother. Oh no, I am indeed your own. Oh, no. Rejoined Mistress Nutter. Ask this woman if it is not so. She is a witch herself, replied Alison. I will not trust either of you. You are all in league with Mother Dendy. We are in league to save thee from her foolish wench, cried Mother Tatar. But thy perverseness will defeat all our schemes. Since you will not fly, my child, cried Mistress Nutter, kneel down and pray earnestly for deliverance. Pray while there is yet time. As she spoke, a growl like thunder was heard in the air and the earth tremble beneath their feet. Nay, now I am sure you are my mother, cried Alison, flinging herself into Mistress Nutter's arms, and I will go with you. But before they could move, several dusty figures were seen rushing towards them. Be on your guard, cried Mother Chattox. Here comes all them deep with a truck. I will aid you all I can. Down on your knees, exclaimed Mistress Nutter. Alison obeyed, but here a word could pass her lips. The infuriated hag, attended by a Beldame band, stood beside them. Mother Dendy eyed the group for a moment as if she would annihilate them. 
out of my way Shut up, she walk for ages Out of my way Or I will drive my knife into thy heart And as her old antagonist maintained her ground She unhesitatingly advanced upon her Smote her with a weapon And as she fell to the ground Set over her bleeding body Now what dost thou hear? Alice Nutter, she cried Menacing her with a blade I am come for my child Whom thou hast stolen from me Replied the lady Thou art come to witness her slaughter Replied the witch fiercely Be gone or I will serve thee As I have just served old Chattop I am not said yet Cried the wounded hag I shall live to see thee bound hand and foot By the officers of justice And certain thou wilt perish Miserably, I shall die content. Spit out thy last drops of venom, black viper, rejoined the mother MD. When I have done with the others, I will return and finish thee, Alice Nutter. Thou knowest it is vain to struggle with me. Give me up the girl. Wilt thou accept my life for hers? said Mistress Nutter. Of what account would thy life be to me? rejoined the mother MD disdainfully. If it would profit me to take it, I would do so without thy consent. But I am about to make an oblation to our master and thou art his already snatch her child from her we waste time she added to her attendants and immediately the weird crew rushed forward and in spite of the miserable mother's efforts tore allison from her i told you it was in vain to contend with me said mother md all that i could call down heaven vengeance upon thy first head cried mistress mother but i am forsaken alike of heaven and man and shall die despairing brave on thou wilt have ample leisure replied the hag and now bring the girl this way, she added to the dame. The sacrifice must be made near the beacon, and as Alison was borne away, Mistress Mother was in a cry of anguish. Do not stay here, said Mother Chattox, raising herself with difficulty. Go after her, you may yet save your daughter. And how, cried Mistress Mother, distractedly. I have no power now. As she saw a dusty form rose up beside her, it was her familiar. Will you return to your duty? I help you in this extremity, he said. I do, do, cried Mother Chattox. Anything to avenge yourself on that murderous hag. Peace, cried Amelia, spurning her with his warm blood. I do not want vengeance, said Mistress Nutter. I only want to save my child. Then you consent on that condition, said Amelia. No, replied Mistress Nutter firmly. I now perceive I am not utterly lost. Since you try to regain me, I have renounced thy master and will make no new bargain with him. Get hence, tempter. Think not to escape us, cried Amelia. No penitence, no absolution can save thee. Thy name is written on the judgment soul and cannot be effaced. I would have aided thee, but since my offer is rejected, I will leave thee. You will not let him go, screamed Mother Chattox. Oh, that the chance were mine. Be silent, or I will beat thy brains out, said familiar. Once more am I dismissed. I forever, replied Mistress Nutter. And as the familiar disappeared, she flew to the spot where her child had been taken. About twenty paces from the beacon, a circle had again been formed by the unhallowed crew in the midst of which stood Mother Demdi with a gory knife in her hand, muttering spells and incantations, and warming mystical ceremonies. Every now and then her companion joined in these rites and chanted a song couched in the wild, unintelligible jargon, beside on which knelt Alison, with her hands tied behind her back, so that she could not raise them in supplication, her hair unbound and cast loosely over her person, and the thick bandage fastened over her eyes and mouth. The initiatory ceremonies over, the old hag approached her victim when Mistress Nutter forced herself in the circle and cast herself at her feet. Spare her, she cried, clinging to her knees. It shall be well for thee if thou dost so. Again interrupted, cried the witch furiously. This time I will show thee no mercy. Take thy fate, meddlesome woman. And she raised the knife, but ere the weapon could descend, it was seized by Mistress Nutter and wrestled from her grasp. In another instant, Alison's arms were liberated and bandaged removed from her eyes. Now it is my turn to threaten. I have thee in my power, infernal high cried Mistress Nutter, holding the knife to the witch's throat and clasping her daughter with the other arm. Wilt let us go? No, replied Mother MD, springing nimbly backwards. You shall go die. I will soon disarm thee. And making one or two passes with her hand, Mistress Nutter dropped a weapon and instantly became fixed and motionless, with her daughter equally rigid in her arms. They looked as if suddenly turned to marble. Now to complete the ceremony, cried Mother MD, picking up a knife. And then she began to mutter an impious address preparatory to the sacrifice. When a loud clangor was heard, like the stroke of an hammer upon a bell, what was that? It's lame and wishing alarm. Were there a clock here? I should say, I should want replied Molly. It must be our master's timepiece, 
said I'd never wish One o'clock exclaimed Mother then me Who appeared to cry with ear And the sacrifice not made Then I am lost A derisive laugh reached her ears In seed from Mother Chattox Who had contrived to raise herself to her feet And tottering forward Now passed through the whole circle Ay, thy term is out Thy soul is watered like mine Aha, and she fell on the ground Perhaps it may not be too late Cried Mother MD Grasping the knife And rushing towards Alison But at this moment A bright flame shot from the beacon Astonishment and terror seized the hag, and she uttered a loud cry, which was echoed by the rest of the crew. The flame mounted higher and higher, and burned each moment more brightly, illumining the whole summit of the hill. By its light could be seen a band of men, some of whom were on horseback, speeding towards the place of meeting. Scared by the sight, the witches fled, but returned by another band, advancing from the opposite quarter. They then made towards the spot where their broomsticks were deposited, but here they could reach it. A third party gained the summit of the hill at its precise point, and immediately started in pursuit of them. Meanwhile, a young man issuing from behind the beacon flew towards Mistress Nutter and her daughter. The moment the flame burst forth, the spell cast over them by Mother Demdi was broken, and motion and speech were restored. Alison exclaimed the young man as he came up. Your trials are over. You are safe. Oh, Richard, she replied, falling into his arms. Have we been preserved by you? I am a mere instrument in the hands of heaven, he replied. Mother Demdi made no attempt at flight with the rest of the witches but remained for a few moments absorbed in contemplation of flaming beacon. Her hand still grasping the murderous weapon she had raised against Alison, but it had dropped to her side when the fire burst fall. At length she turned fiercely to Richard and demanded, Was it thou who kindled beacon? It was, replied the young man. And who bade thee to do it? Who brought thee hither? Pursued a wish. An enemy of thine, old woman, replied Richard. His vengeance has been slow in coming, but it has arrived at last. But who is he? I see him not, rejoined Mother MD. You will see him before. Silence, said Richard. I should have come to your assistance sooner, Alison, he continued, turning to her. But I was forbidden, and I knew I should best ensure your safety by compliance with the injunctions I had received. Some guardian spirit must have interposed to preserve us, replied Alison, for such only could have successfully combated the evil being from whom we have been delivered. Thy spirit is unable to preserve thee now, cried Mother Demby, aiming a deadly blow at her with a knife. Unfortunately, the attempt was foreseen. By Richard, who caught her arm and wrestled the weapon from her. Curses on thee, Richard Ashton cried, infuriated high, and on thee too, Alison device. I cannot work ye the immediate ill I wish. I cannot make ye loathsome in one another's eyes. I cannot maim your limbs or blight your beauty. I cannot deliver you all to devilish possession. I can bequeath you a legacy of okay. hate. What I say will come to pass. Thou, Alison, wilt never wed Richard Ashton. Never. Vainly shall ye struggle with your destiny, vainly indulge hopes of happiness, misery and despair, and an early grave are in store for both of you. He shall be to you your worst enemy, and you shall be to him destruction. Think of the witch's prediction, and tremble, and may her deadliest curse rest on your head. For Richard exclaimed Alison, who would have sunk to the ground if he had not sustained her. Why did you not prevent this terrible maldition? He could not reply to Mother MD with a laugh and of exultation. It shall work, and thy doom shall be accomplished. And now to make an end of old chattox, and then they may take me where they please. And she was approaching her old enemy with the intention of putting her threat into execution, when James Device, who appeared to start on the ground, rushed swiftly towards her. What art thou doing here, Jem? cried the hag, regarding him with angry surprise. Dost thou not see we are surrounded by enemies? I cannot escape them, thou art young and acting away with thee. Not without you, Granny, replied Jem. I have run as fast as I could to help you. Stick fast, hold on me, he added, snatching her up in his arms. And I'm bringing you clear off yet. And he set off at a rapid pace with his servant, Richard being too much occupied with Alison to oppose him.